Go ahead and have a seat, ladies. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the truth of your word that we can have before us in your Bible. We thank you that you have not left um, yourself unknown, unrevealed to us. And we're just thankful that as we open your word, we can hear you speak to us in it. You have not stuttered, you have not been unclear, you have not spoken in some kind of a mystery. You're not speaking in code, you are speaking clearly. And you are revealing yourself to us. The greatest revelation of yourself is your son Jesus and it is him that we want to see more clearly in this conference as these ladies gather together, I know. So open our eyes and let us behold him and the wonderful things you have for us in your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Um, it always seems a little awkward for me to be like the guy at the beginning of a women's conference. Hi, welcome. The honesty, the honesty is I'm the one who feels awkward right now, not none of you. Um, I told Kenny out there, I said, can I just stand here with you for a while? Um, it was great. Thank you so much for coming to the women's conference. Um, trust that this will be a great time for you. If you're visiting, we're especially glad that you have joined along and come with whomever you've come with and you accepted the invitation and trust that you'll find lots and lots of um, just good hospitality taking care of you, people here with open hearts and open hands ready to serve you in any way that they can. Um, it's really a privilege to be able to be with you tonight. Um, Cameron Dodd will be speaking all day tomorrow and um, batting cleanup, fixing whatever doesn't go right here tonight. But it's good to, to be with you and um, especially to talk about this, this great topic of, of just suffering, and, but enduring suffering and doing it with joy. Um, so if you have your notebook, um, you can go ahead and open it up to session one. And what I really hope to accomplish with you tonight, Lord willing, is I want you to see from God's word that suffering is not an accident, okay? Suffering is not an accident in this world. Suffering is not an uncontrollable rogue element on the loose in the world. And suffering is not an afterthought in God's mind. Rather, you're going to see that suffering is, is a first thought in God's mind. Um, that suffering is indeed God's plan for you and for me. And, but, but most of all, first of all, it's his plan for himself. For himself. Um, suffering is a centerpiece in his plan to bring glory to himself and to bring good to you. Think about it. What is your, where does your best good come from as a believer in Jesus Christ? It comes from the worst suffering that ever took place. Your best good comes from the worst suffering that ever took place in human history. You and I would have never written a story that way. We just wouldn't but that's God's story for us. God had in his own mind suffering, his own suffering before the human race ever experienced suffering. He had in his mind his own suffering before any human ever suffered. Therefore, if all this is true, if suffering is not an accident, it's not un an uncontrollable rogue element in the world, uh, that suffering is not an afterthought in God's mind, but it is a first thought in his mind, and if it's indeed his plan, then the goal should be to learn how to see your own suffering in light of that, in the shadow of that, in the shade of that, to see your suffering under his great plan um, that he has for suffering in his plan. Um, the goal should be to trust him a little more deeply um, with your own suffering. Um, he is the one who planned to suffer himself first, again, as you'll see 
And his plan was to suffer not just kind of a little bit, you know, to get you started so you could see, but to suffer the worst, to suffer greatly in ways that you and I, will, we just won't have to suffer. And if it was his plan to do it first, and there is in his plan room for you to suffer, you can trust him. Um, you can trust him. We can trust the one who suffered greatly with our own lesser sufferings. And maybe a goal from this would be to maybe be a little less surprised at suffering's constant presence in your life or reinsertion into your life. Again, maybe be a little less surprised at when that happens. And one of the goals is to prime the pump, so to speak, for Cameron's messages tomorrow. And so one of the things we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna basically start in Genesis and we're gonna end in Revelation uh, by the time we're all done. And we're just gonna kind of get a feel for what God's plan is for suffering. Um, and so what I wanna do is you can just kind of turn through your notebook and see the, the eight points. Um, and I promise the, the next three hours are gonna go so fast. <laughs> but, and I always say stuff like that, don't I? But I wanna give you the roadmap. I want you to see the eight things we're gonna walk through and just summarize them for you, and then we'll walk through them. And I, and I promise we're, we're not, we, we can't spend a lot of time on any one of them. But I want, to, I want you to see the roadmap. Number one, what we'll look at is God's Old Testament announcements of his plan to suffer. His plan for his own suffering, okay? Long before he ever suffered, it was in his mind long ago to do so and was planning it. Secondly, then, we, we'll look at Jesus' commitment to those very Old Testament announcements. Jesus knew those announcements in the Old Testament and he was resolutely committed to them. Thirdly then, we'll look and see that Jesus actually added his own announcements of his impending suffering to those prior announcements. And he hasn't even suffered yet. But I'm just wanting you to see that the Bible is just relentless in saying God is gonna suffer, God is gonna suffer, God is gonna suffer, and Jesus is saying, it has to be fulfilled this way. Can it not happen this way? It must happen this way. And here's how it's gonna happen. I will be scourged, I will be mocked, I will be crucified, I will die. And then numbers four and five, we'll, we'll just do a, a brief survey of his actual suffering. He suffered before he ever was on trial and went to the cross. And then he suffered obviously in the, his trial and at the cross. We'll then look at number six, the apostles' affirmations of God's Old Testament plan for Christ's suffering. Boy, they just could not get it when Jesus kept telling him what was gonna happen, right? They really struggled to get that, but what a difference a resurrection made and 40 days with the resurrected Jesus um, correcting all of the wrong thinking. And then number seven, of course, for us, there are tremendous benefits from Christ's suffering And one of those benefits is number eight, that Christ actually has a plan for us to suffer with him. And so we kind of separate that one off on its own. It's interesting, suffering didn't end at his resurrection. But he said he has an example for us to follow. So here's how I want you to kind of think of the session one notes. You've got a lot of stuff there. You can see how much I put in there. It's really for you, it's, it's a reference that you can go back to later. I wanted just to give you all of the scriptures that I had found, and certainly it's not all of them in, in the Bible, but I spent most of the time in the New Testament, as you can tell, uh, in regards to Christ. But I want you to use it as a resource for later, for further study. Um, tonight, you, you may want to, uh, listen more than you try to write stuff down at points. In other points, you might want to try to scribble something down. If you miss it, don't worry about it. It's being recorded, and um, you can come back and look at it and re-listen later. Um, there's going to be some times where I'm going to go so quickly, you're not going to be able to turn to the Bible passages, and so you just might want to listen um, and go back and look at it on your own. So I'm going to turn the fire hose on now, okay? And... Um, so here we go. So turn to Genesis chapter three and let's talk about number one, God's Old Testament 
announcements of his plan to suffer. Here's the very first one. Adam and Eve have fallen in the garden in sin. They are hiding from God. God drags them out into the open along with the serpent, and he is rebuking them and also giving promises. And Genesis 3.15 is often called the first preaching of the gospel in your Bible. And this is what God says to the serpent. The seed of the woman shall crush you, he says to the serpent, on the head. And you, serpent, shall bruise him, the seed of the woman, on the heel. And what we know transpires from here is that Yahweh will actually take on flesh. The God of the Old Testament, the God specifically revealed to Israel as their covenant God, the one who keeps his promises, Yahweh, will take on flesh. He will be the seed of the woman. And God determines here at the very beginning of your Bible that he will be bruisable. You ever thought of it that way? He will be bruisable, but not defeatable. God says he himself will be struck. He will receive a blow from the devil. So the hope for the first sinners who are hearing this, Adam and Eve, is found in this. Their hope centers somehow, some way on God's plan to take on flesh and to be able to be bruisable. And it's in connection with this rebellion that they just carried out. So we're rebels and we're hearing that God will be bruisable at some point. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 2. familiar psalm. David is probably the human author. Psalm 2 helps introduce, along with Psalm 1, all of the psalms. The first three verses. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, against his Messiah, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. So Messiah is going to actually suffer the rebellion and the treason that the nations perpetrate against him one day. Uh, By the way, this is about a thousand years before Messiah ever came. He will suffer their rejection. He will suffer them casting him off. They want nothing to do with them. Go to Psalm 22, verse 1 and verse 18. Psalm 22, verse 1. You know these. These these words are, are Jesus' words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. I'm groaning, and there's no deliverance near me. Far from my groaning is my my deliverance. Messiah will suffer the worst forsaking of all. It is God forsaking him, the Father forsaking him at the cross. Look at verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Messiah one day will be so incapacitated, so vulnerable that they'll take his clothing from him. God will have his clothing taken from him. Again, 1,000 years before he ever came. Turn to Psalm 118, verse 22. Psalm 118, verse 22. One of the most quoted verses in the New Testament. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And notice verse 23, this is Yahweh's doing. So whose idea is this, that the chief stone would get rejected? It's Yahweh's plan. His plan is to be assessed by men and then to be rejected by them, only then to ultimately become that chief cornerstone that everything else gets patterned off of. And by the way, it's very probable that Moses wrote Psalm 118. 
And so that puts it 1,400 years before Christ ever came. So all of these announcements having to do with Messiah suffering one day. Let's go to Isaiah 49. Verses five to seven. And now says Yahweh, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the sight of Yahweh and my God is my strength. Okay, so understand, Yahweh is speaking to his servant. And, and what's clear now is that this servant is not Jacob or Israel, the servant of God, but it's a different servant. It's the servant who's going to help bring Jacob back to Yahweh. And so this is Yahweh's servant with a capital S. And then Yahweh says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So it's not enough that you, my servant, are just gonna draw Israel back. I'm, you're gonna be a light to the nations, to the Gentiles. Verse seven, thus says Yahweh, the redeemer of Israel and its holy one. This is what he says to the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, Kings will see and rise. Princes will also bow down because of Yahweh who is faithful and the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. So this Messiah, this suffering servant is gonna come and he is gonna be despised and abhorred. Go to chapter 50, verses four to nine. The Lord Yahweh has given me the tongue of disciples. So here the suffering servant is speaking again. He has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. Uh, the Lord Yahweh has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. This servant will do everything that Yahweh says. That's important. I gave my back to those who strike me and I gave my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Isaiah writes 700 years before Christ. And here we are finding out that the servant of Yahweh is going to turn his back and actually let his creatures strike the creator on the back. He's gonna give to his creatures his face and they'll grab his beard and they'll pluck it out. They will spit in Yahweh's face. Of course, go to Isaiah 52, verse 14. Obviously, 52, 13 through 53, 12 is the great section on the suffering servant. What detail comes here? Again, 700 years before Christ, it is the most vivid and graphic account of his suffering 52 verse 14, it says that his appearance and form are marred more than any man. In 53, three, it says that he was despised, forsaken, sorrowful, acquainted with grief, shameful, and people hid their faces from him. They were ashamed to even look at him. He was not esteemed. Verse five of chapter 53, he was pierced through, he was crushed, he was chastened, he was scourged. Verse seven, he was oppressed, afflicted, and slaughtered like, like a lamb. 53, eight, he was taken away in judgment. He was cut off from the land of the living. He received the stroke that was due Israel. If anybody deserved to be smacked, it was Israel, but he received that stroke. 53.10, he was put to grief. 53.11, he experienced anguish of soul. 53.12, he poured out himself to death. 700 years before he ever came, we are told of this kind of suffering. Go to Zechariah chapter 12. This is a parallel kind of passage and prophecy with Isaiah. This is 500 years before Christ. Zechariah was a prophet after the um, deportations of Israel and Judah into Babylon. 
twelve ten, Zechariah twelve ten, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. We did this to him. And, and note it, this is just really interesting. Uh, Yahweh says, they will look on me whom they have pierced. So who's the one getting pierced? It's God. It's Yahweh. And they will mourn for, he doesn't say me, but him. So Yahweh will be him in the flesh, the second member of the Godhead. And they'll mourn for him thinking we really did this to, to our, our Savior our Messiah. Go to chapter 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, says Yahweh, and against the man, my associate, declares Yahweh of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Again, 500 years before Christ, the sword will be awakened against Yahweh's shepherd and he will be struck. And the sheep will scatter. And that is exactly what happened in the garden. Uh, now, go to the New Testament. I want you to see 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 13. This is so great, so amazing. 1 Peter 1, 10 to 13. See, you're, you're, you're frustrated because you're like, I was, I was writing something down and now you're telling me to turn. Just deal with it, okay? <laughs> it's a small form of suffering you'll have to endure for the next bit of time. First Peter chapter one, verse 10. Here's what Peter says. As to this salvation, the prophets, the ones that we were just all looking at, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, he's writing to the church, to you believers, they made careful searches and inquiries. What, what were they interested in? Verse 11, they were seeking to know what person is this? And what time is this? When is this gonna take place? That the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as the spirit predicted what? The sufferings of Messiah, of Christ, and the glories to follow. So what were all, what, were, what was Zechariah doing? What was Isaiah doing? What was Moses doing? What was David doing? What were, they, what were they doing as they were writing these things? Who is this and when? There's nothing in there about, uh, we're really confused. We're not really sure what you meant. What, what did you mean? No, they knew that it was going to be Messiah and they knew it was coming. They just didn't know when and they knew it was all about suffering. Did God make himself clear in these Old Testament announcements about him suffering? Absolutely. Indeed, he did. Now, understand this. This, as we finish up number one, this is not merely God announcing that suffering in general will have a general place out there in the world of men. Rather, don't miss this. God is announcing from the earliest days that he himself plans to suffer that he will take on in himself excruciating, humiliating suffering unto death as a man, and it's somehow in connection with transgression and sin and rebellion. So the God who created everything created the stage that he would get on on which he would display his own suffering, and he's announcing it thousands of years before it ever happened. Okay? Number two, Jesus' commitment to those very Old Testament announcements. That's the point. How, Yahweh comes in the flesh. He takes on flesh in Jesus of Nazareth. The seed of the woman has come. Back in Genesis 3.15, that seed of the woman. He has finally arrived. And what is his disposition towards those Old Testament announcements? Well, he's unswervingly committed to this plan already that has been revealed in the Old Testament scriptures through the prophets. In fact, 
at such crucial points in his earthly ministry, he said so. Don't turn to these, but I'm just gonna tell you about them. Mark 9 is the Mount of Transfiguration. He gets asked a question about Elijah and John the Baptist, and why did they do that to John the Baptist? And, and he says, Jesus says in that clarification, he says, yet how it is written of the son of man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt. So yeah, they did anything they wanted to to, to uh, John the Baptist and yet how it is written of me, the son of man, that he will suffer many things be treated with contempt. Um, he knows that this has already been written. Mark 14, this is in connection with Judas' betrayal at the Passover table. He says, Jesus said this, for the son of man is to go just as it is written of him. In other words, everything, the night before, just a matter of hours away from his own suffering, he is saying everything is progressing just as it is written. In Matthew 26 and in Mark 14, this is in the garden at his arrest and at his impending suffering. Um, Peter takes out his sword and, and wields the sword like a fisherman because that's what he was and he didn't know how to wield the, a sword. Takes the ear off uh, one of the servants and Jesus says, how then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say it must happen this way? So what is he doing even in the garden? He's protecting the plan from his own disciple. It's amazing. Before it ever happened, he says in Matthew um, 26, all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. In Luke 24, even after his resurrection with two disciples on the way to Emmaus, resurrected Messiah was convinced that the Old Testament scriptures were clear about his suffering and he even rebuked those disciples because they didn't get it, right? You remember? He says in 24, verses 26 to 27, he says, it was necessary for Messiah to suffer these things. Beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained these things to them, these sufferings he went through. He opened up the Old Testament to them and he explained it to them. So Jesus was obviously aware of these announcements ahead of time. But more than that, he was unwaveringly committed to them. In fact, he's even protecting them along the way, ensuring that this is the way it must go. And just as God in the Old Testament made announcements, so now Jesus, number three, is going to add some more of his own announcements to the prior announcements. So number three, Jesus' announcements of his impending suffering. See how fast it's going now? It's just like moving right along. Great. Number three, and again, I'm just going to refer these to you. I'm not going to take you to each one because we're not going to have enough time to be able to do that. But in Matthew 16 and in Mark 8, that's at Peter's confession. And that is when Jesus said, so Peter confesses, you're the, you're the Lord, you're the one, you're it. Uh, Jesus says, Christ will suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, scribes, and be killed. At the Mount of Transfiguration again in Matthew 17, Jesus says, so also, just like John the Baptist, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And then down from the Mount of Transfiguration, there's a healing that takes place at the uh, bottom of the mountain. And he announces one more time there in 17, 22 to 23, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. Then in Matthew 20, verses 17 and 19 and Mark 10, this is prior to his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Um, he says, the son of man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death, hand him over to the Gentiles to mock him and scourge him and crucify him. And Mark 10 adds, and spit on him. So all of a sudden, now he's right before entering into Jerusalem. And did you hear how much longer the list of suffering is? how much more detail is coming. He tells the sons of Zebedee when their mommy asked if they could sit at the right and left hand of him in, in the kingdom, he said, uh, can you drink the cup that I'm supposed to drink? Can, can you undergo the baptism, the plunging that I'm to go through? You think you can do this? Um, and, and all his point is there is that he, he has a cup of suffering to drink and he is going to be not dipped, sprinkled, misted with suffering. He is going to be plunged into it. That's what baptized means. 
He's going to be baptized into it. In Matthew 21, when he gets into Jerusalem, and in Mark 12 and in Luke 20, he tells the parable of the landowner. You remember that? Um, the, the, the landowner sends servants to go and, and check on things and they kill and they beat and they you know, scar up these servants who go and then finally the landowner says, I know what I'll do, I'll send my son. They'll respect him and they send him and what, how's the story go? The, the, the tenants say, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And so they took him, they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And that was Jesus' illustration of what was about to happen with him and Israel. When he had the Passover meal with his disciples in Luke 22, he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this with you before I suffer. And then in the garden, Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and Luke 22 and John 18, in his prayer in the garden, he mentions that cup again. Let this cup pass. Not my will, but yours, he says. If this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. He's acknowledging that he will continue to go forward with this. In Mark 14, he says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Luke's account says he was being in agony in the garden. His sweat became like drops of blood. And then finally, when he was arrested in Matthew 26, verse 45, he said, the hour is at hand. Now just stop and think the hour. This is it. This is what everything, all of the announcements prior to this, it comes down to an hour. This is it. The hour is at hand and the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. He was betrayed with a kiss. A kiss. They seized him. They laid hands on him. And so from the Old Testament announcements of God's plan to suffer to Jesus' commitment to those Old Testament plans and announcements, Jesus adding his own announcements to those, what should you conclude? There is no doubt that God pre-planned to bring suffering near to himself in Messiah. There's no doubt at all. There's no doubt that he would take on suffering in his own person. So let's Think about some of these sufferings in Numbers 4 and 5. Let's do number 4 first. So you see that big long list of verses there, and then you see the words down below that. I, I just selected some of the, the language out of those and the verbiage out of some of those verses so you could see them. I want you to see the ways that he suffered. I want you to see a list of his sufferings before he ever got to a trial, Okay. So the sufferings are summarized. This is what he had to suffer. Even at his birth, Simeon said that um, his birth is a sign to be embraced. That's not what Simeon said. A sign to be what? Do you know what it, what it says? Opposed. This one, his birth is a sign of opposition. Can you imagine somebody walking into your um, hospital room after you've just given birth and you're holding your precious little one and they say that about your baby? Oh, this is opposition. You'd be thinking, what on earth? What did Herod try to do? Herod searched to destroy him. We're told in Revelation 12 that the dragon uh, tried to devour the child that was born. He had to suffer that. At Nazareth, when he stepped into his public ministry for the first time, they were so filled with rage at him that they drove him out of the city to throw him down a cliff. That's Luke 4. He had to suffer this. They said he's a blasphemer. Get this. God, you're a blasphemer. He had to suffer that. They said he casts out demons by Beelzebul. They said he is a Samaritan and has a demon. They said he is insane. They said Yahweh in the flesh is a gluttonous man and a drunkard. He had to suffer that. They said his testimony is not true. God, you're not telling the truth. Of course, they didn't acknowledge him of God. That's the whole point. The son of man said he had nowhere to lay his head. God, who made everything, had no place, he had no home. 
They falsely accused him. They tested him maliciously. They conspired to destroy him. They tried to trap him. They dishonored him. They said he has lost his senses. They were not believing him. He had to suffer that. Yahweh had to stand before men, tell him he is Messiah, and they say, we don't believe you. He had to suffer that. They sought to seize him. They watched and spied on him to catch him. They wanted to seize him by stealth and kill him. They were very hostile toward him. They plotted against him. They were persecuting Jesus. They hated him without a cause. They picked up stones to stone him. Judas planned to betray him to the religious leadership. His soul was deeply grieved to the point of death. His soul was troubled. He was troubled in spirit. All before he ever was on trial. That was his life. Number five, Jesus suffering at his trial and cross. This is what you know. This is where our gospel is centered. These are the gospel accounts of his sufferings at his trial and cross. And so I'll summarize them for you in the little paragraph below that. This is what he had to suffer. They accused him of blasphemy. They spat in his face. He received slaps in the face from the religious leaders. They beat him with their fists. They accused him harshly. They bound him. They delivered him to Pilate. They handed him over for envy. He had to suffer that. They yelled, crucify him. They scourged him. So he gave his back to them, right? They crowned him with thorns. They mocked him with a purple robe, bowing down before him. He had to suffer that. He's God, They beat him on the head with a reed. They crucified him. They hurled abuse at him on the cross. They sneered at him on the cross. He, this is interesting. He refused wine mixed with gall and wine mixed with myrrh. Remember that? Why? He would not blunt his sensitivities to his suffering because he had to drink the cup. He had to be plunged into it all the way. No painkillers. They insulted him. He knew he was forsaken by God. He cried out with a loud voice. He cried, it is finished. And then they pierced his side. Now, these are the ways that other and more New Testament writers, I want to isolate some of these for you. Philippians 2 says that he emptied himself. He humbled himself, now listen to this. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Obedient to what? What was he having to obey? You know, all of those Old Testament announcements that he was going to suffer. He had to obey them. And so he was obedient to death, all the way to death. He did it. The father's long-determined plan for the son to suffer had to be obeyed. The hour had come and he obeyed that plan to death. Hebrews chapter two, verses nine and 10, he was made a little lower than the angels and because of the sufferings of death, he was crowned with glory and honor, the suffering of death. He tasted death for us. The author of our salvation was perfected through sufferings. I don't know if that's ever bothered you. You don't need to be bothered by that. He was completed through his sufferings. He was brought to completion through sufferings. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. Hebrews 5, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears. He was a man who was suffering. He cried to the one able to save him from death and he was heard because of his piety. He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Listen, he had to obey the plan and he learned obedience through his sufferings. Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. The cross and shame, what suffering he went through. And he sat down and he endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Cross, shame, hostility. And in Revelation 1, 7, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him will see him and all the tribes will mourn over him. So, so think on this. The son was complete. The son was perfected in all that he was and did when? 
when he suffered to death. Without the seed of the woman suffering, without Yahweh in the flesh suffering, the second member of the Godhead was still God. It's not an issue of he's not complete as God. He was still God, but he was not yet complete in his role to suffer. Do you understand that? Until he obeyed to death and learned obedience from suffering. He didn't need to learn to obey because there was something about just being obedient that he needed to figure out. He needed to be obedient to the announcements in the Old Testament that he must be the sin bearer and suffer greatly. Think about it this way. To be the second member of the Godhead, but not suffer according to all of those announcements, that's not the complete picture, is it, of who that Yahweh in the flesh is? When is it the complete picture of who he is? When he suffers. And so he was perfected in that. And that's what the word means. It means complete. And it's not to imply that he was somehow incomplete in his being. He was God. But in his role, it wasn't complete until when? Until he suffered. And the whole point in that kind of language is we can have 100% confidence that what God planned, Jesus completed. What God planned in regards to his suffering, Jesus completed. He brought it to completion. Not one inch of God's plan to suffer failed or fell short. So, the Godhead was that committed to the Son taking on flesh to suffer and the son was unwaveringly committed to obey to the point of death, and he did so in his suffering. And throughout his life, before his suffering, he tried to tell his disciples, he tried to tell his apostles that he would suffer before his suffering ever came. And that message of suffering did not get embraced by them at that point. But when he was raised from the dead and he spent 40 days with them before he ascended into heaven, everything changed. He taught them everything that the Old Testament clearly said about him and his suffering. And the question is, did they finally get it? And the answer is absolutely, absolutely. Number six, the apostles' affirmations of God's Old Testament plan for Christ's sufferings. Let's look at Acts chapter two, verse 23. You can turn to this one. We'll maybe let you look at a few of these. Acts 2, verse 23. It's the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. They're being mocked for the phenomenon that's occurring in tongues. So Peter stands up to preach, and he says in Acts 2, 23, watch how certain he is of the Old Testament announcements. This man, he's talking about Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. So what was the predetermined plan? What was the foreknowledge? What, did, what was the thought that was first in God's mind that he had about what his plan was gonna do? It involved delivering Yahweh in the flesh over, delivering him over to the suffering. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put him to death. Peter's not having any problems seeing, no, this was planned, right? They were convinced of God's prior plan for Messiah's suffering. Look at chapter three, verse 18 of Acts. 3, 18. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, well, what, did, what was announced by the mouth of all the prophets? Well, that his Messiah would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Okay, so Peter not only knew that it was announced beforehand, he knew that it was done. He's confident of it. Go to chapter four, verse 11. He is the stone which was rejected by you, Peter says to the religious leadership in Jerusalem. He's the stone which was rejected by you. He's quoting Psalm 118. He's quoting Moses. 
you're the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. Drop down to verse 26. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Well, what is that? That's Psalm 2. For truly in the city that were gathered together against your holy servant, this is his prayer to um, God after they were released. So he's praying this. For truly in the city that were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you, Father, anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate. Okay, so there's a king and there's a governor. There's the rulers of Psalm 2. And the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. This was all God's plan for this to take place. Psalm 118, Psalm 2 were fulfilled in Christ. What God planned before is done. Listen, Christ's suffering was not a mystery that is now all of a sudden revealed by the apostles. His suffering is not a mystery. It was clear. And in Christ's death, the suffering was done. In Acts 13, 27, and verses 27 and 29, the Jerusalem rulers, uh, Paul says, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, fulfilled these by condemning him. So the way to fulfill the scriptures was by condemning Messiah. And they did that. And I love, I, I don't love it. I think it's very interesting. They, they fulfilled those scriptures, not by understanding it and obeying it and being faithful to it. They fulfilled it, not even recognizing it. So it, it, it was able to happen even through people who didn't understand what was going on. You couldn't thwart God's plan. The fulfillment was not dependent on their submission to the scriptures. In Acts 17, when Paul's in Thessalonica, it says that he reasoned with them from the scriptures as he's in the synagogue, explaining and giving evidence that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. And he said, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is that Messiah. So did God plan this all along? Yes, God planned this all along, Paul says. And who is the Messiah? Well, we know it's Jesus and it's finished. In Acts 26, verses 22 to 23, Paul says, I state nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that Messiah was to suffer. In other words, what Paul is saying is, look, I've got nothing to add. I stated nothing except what was already written. I, I can't add to it. There's nothing to add to it. It is sufficient. It is complete. It is done. So the men he sent out from Jerusalem toward the ends of the earth were absolutely committed to the Old Testament scriptures, to the Old Testament announcements that Christ would take on suffering in his flesh. That was their message. They staked their lives on that message. They gave their lives because of that message. So, God planned suffering. But more than that, I mean, all we've looked at so far is he planned his own suffering. He planned that. And Christ unwaveringly was committed to it. He, Christ obeyed that plan to death. And the apostles who went to the ends of the earth affirmed that message and preached that message to the ends of the earth. And you and I are hearing that. Many of you have heard that and, and believe that message. And what benefits flow to you and me from that message? Let's look at number seven the benefits from Christ's suffering, but they are the benefits for the one who believes. You must be one who believes in this Messiah whose name is Jesus. And you see all of the verses there. I, I, I included Isaiah 53 because it's so graphic in its descriptions and then scanned through the New Testament and gave you many more there and you see that great big long paragraph of, I actually want you to, get the, the shower of this, the, the downpour of this over your, your heart and your mind. The benefits, these are the benefits that we have. Now understand this, listen carefully. These are the benefits that we as believers have, not because we have suffered and these are our reward. These are the benefits that we have because somebody else suffered greatly. Do you understand that? Somebody else suffered greatly and we have benefits? 
These are, this is what is true for every single one who believes. Um, we have been drawn to God because he was lifted up at the cross. The salvation work we needed is finished. There's nothing left for us to, or anyone else to contribute to it. Our griefs and our sorrows are born and taken away. We don't have to be pierced through for our transgressions because he was. We don't have to be crushed for our iniquities because he was. We don't have to be chastened. He was. We are healed. Our iniquity is taken away. We don't have to receive the stroke that is due us. Our guilt is taken away. God's wrath is satisfied. We are justified by his blood. We are declared righteous. We have forgiveness of sins. Our sin is taken away. It's wiped away. Our sins are not counted against us, all because he suffered. We are spiritually rich through his poverty at the cross. We are rescued from this present evil age, Galatians 1. God publicly demonstrated his righteousness, Romans 3. We are not delivered over to judgment because of our transgressions. We are saved from wrath because he suffered. We are reconciled. We are united with him in his death. Our old self was crucified with him. Our body of sin is done away with in that we are no longer slaves to sin. Do you recognize Romans 6? Right? We no longer live for ourselves, 2 Corinthians 5, because he suffered. Christ lives in us because he was crucified and we were crucified with him. We have been freely given all things necessary. We are not chargeable. We are not condemnable. We have an intercessor. We are inseparable from Christ. We are loved because he suffered. We overwhelmingly conquer no matter how dire the circumstances are. This is Romans 8. We are loved. Yes, that's a repeat on purpose. We have comfort in abundance. We have been redeemed from the curse of the law. We do not have to bear the curse. The blessing of Abraham is ours because he suffered. We are brought near to God. We are united with others in a body, a new man. This is he, Ephesians 2. All horizontal and vertical barriers are broken down because he suffered. The enmity tied to the law is undone. Peace has been established vertically and horizontally in the church. We are loved. Did we mention that before? We are sanctified. We are cleansed with his word. We are presented spotless, blameless in all of our glory as the body of Christ. Ephesians 5. We are holy. We are rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into his kingdom because he suffered. The certificate of debt with decrees against us and all hostility against us in judgment is canceled out because he suffered. We have the only power effective against fleshly indulgences because he suffered. We are not destined for wrath, but for obtaining salvation. We have a mediator. We are ransomed. We are redeemed from every lawless deed. We are purified to be a part of his unique people. We are zealous for good deeds because he suffered. We have purification for our sins. The devil has been rendered powerless regarding death. We are freed from the fear of death. We have a merciful and faithful and sympathetic high priest who is able to aid in our temptations. We have the once and for all sacrifice needed. Do you recognize the language from Hebrews? Can you pick out some of these, this kind of language as you go through? We have eternal redemption we have cleansed, a cleansed conscience. We are confident to enter the holy place. We can draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith because he suffered. Our hearts are sprinkled clean an evil conscience cleansed. Our bodies are washed. We are loved and released from our sins by his blood. We are purchased and brought into a kingdom of priests and we will reign all because he suffered. These are our benefits as believers. And repentance for forgiveness of sins can be announced because he suffered. The message of his cross, the message of his suffering, 1 Corinthians 1, is the power of God for us who believe. In 2 Corinthians 5, we have a message of reconciliation entrusted to us and we go and we beg people to be reconciled to God. These are benefits even the gospel message that we get to go preach and proclaim, this is one of the benefits because he suffered. So again, another man, another man, not you, not me, another man suffered greatly and we benefit this much. We did not have to suffer to get these benefits. Again, it's not a reward. It's not a pat on the back, good job for suffering. But he had to suffer so that we could have the benefits. 
But there's one more benefit that I isolated away. Do you see it? We have an example for us to follow. And this is 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to turn there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. No, it's 221, I'm sorry. You knew that, didn't you? You're like, he's not right. I'm looking at it in my Bible, I'm like, that is not the right verse. It's a good verse, but it's not the right one. 221. What does it say? For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Suffering is going to continue even though Christ's suffering fulfilled everything of his suffering that he was supposed to obey. Suffering is going to continue for me and for you if you're a believer Suffering is going to continue on in me and in you, if you're a believer. The benefits that come from his suffering are a part of his plan, right? And nobody here disagrees with that or has any problem with that. But our suffering is also one of the benefits that comes from his suffering. Since he suffered for you, You've been called for this purpose to follow in his footsteps. All tears and all mourning and all suffering and all loss and all pain did not immediately terminate throughout all of the human race and throughout all of the world when Jesus completed his own suffering at the cross and was raised from the dead. Even though he fulfilled God's plan for his suffering, suffering did not come to an end. God has yet still more suffering planned and it's for you and me. I want the benefits of his suffering. I want that whole paragraph, I want it. I wrestle with wanting the example of his suffering to follow in his footsteps. How about you? So now let's look at number eight. Christ's plan for our own suffering. By the way, you you know this, but there is no human anywhere in any location in any time period since Genesis 3 who has not suffered or who will not experience suffering. You know that, right? Unbeliever and believer alike, um, we could say as Job 5, 7 says, are born for trouble as surely as sparks fly upward from a fire. There, whatever you get in your mind, you think, man, it's some suffering for being a believer. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, should I be a believer? Uh, you're gonna get suffering no matter who you are, no matter what you are, no matter where you go in life, you're gonna suffer. It's just the way that it is under the sun. There is no condition to pursue that will be empty of suffering in this life. Everyone suffers. Not everyone has hope or joy in their suffering. And Cameron will help you tomorrow thinking about um, how we are to suffer, how our suffering looks different. We endure it with joy. And and you'll also see how things end for us is very different. Um, You see that whole long paragraph there of all those verses. There's a lot of scriptures in the New Testament from Jesus and the New Testament writers about believers suffering. Do you see all that? And I'm pretty sure that's not all of them. So what I wanna do is I wanna walk you through some of them. I've I've selected some of them out just to try to crystallize some of this of Christ's plan for you, believer. 
This is his plan. In the first one, Matthew 10 and Luke 12, Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword, to bring division that would result in a father turning a son into the authorities and a son turning a parent into authorities and suffering would come because family members would turn. And he said, I came to do that. Do you want to follow him? In Matthew 10 and Acts 18, um, but especially in Matthew 10, Jesus said, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Jesus said that. Jesus said that. You're gonna get bit sometimes. He's not sending us into an awards assembly, (laughs) right? But into wolves. In Matthew 5 and Matthew 10 and Mark 13, et cetera, Jesus over and over said, we suffer because of his name, because of him. He, he, he's, and when is he saying these things? As he steps out into humanity in, in his public ministry, he's saying, I, I just want you to know, humanity, um, I came to bring division. Um, I, if you're gonna follow me, I'm gonna send you into the wolves. And um, you're gonna suffer because of my name. It's gonna be because of me. I mean, what is his message to the people who are checking him out? I heard this guy just healed leprosy. I heard that a blind man now sees. I'm gonna go check this guy out. What is he saying? Over and over and over and over. John 15, he tells his disciples on the last night um, that they are hated as Jesus was hated. We're hated because Jesus was hated. In Matthew 10 and in Mark 8 and Luke 9, Jesus calls us to carry a, take up your Disneyland pass, right? Take up your Disneyland pass and follow me. I mean, you can all skip into the magical kingdom together. That's not what he says. What does he say? A cross, an implement of excruciating pain and suffering. I kind of feel like a Disneyland pass is the same thing, but... (laughs) <laughs> but, but he says, if you're gonna come after me, you have to be willing to what? Suffer. In Acts 9, oh, this is great. Let's go to Acts 9. We've got all the time in the world. Come on, let's go to Acts 9. <laughs> Saul has been persecuting the church. He is on his way to Damascus. He's got authority from the religious leadership of the temple to go find Christians there and bring them back and persecute them. And a bright light stops him dead in his tracks. He fell to the ground, verse four of Acts nine. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting? What does he say? Me? No, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm gonna help you out on this. You're at the right hand of the throne of your father in heaven And Saul hasn't been persecuting you. He's been persecuting the Christians. No, Jesus is right. What is he saying? When you persecute my sheep, you're persecuting me, Saul. So what does that tell you how Jesus identifies himself with our suffering? He does, intimately. He calls it his own persecution. It's precious, he gives us an, an, an example to follow him as we looked in 1 Peter 2. In Romans 8 and in 2 Corinthians 1 and chapter 4 and Philippians 3, and we actually share in and complete Christ's suffering. Well, how is it that we complete Christ's suffering? Well, we certainly don't complete his suffering that is tied to atoning for our sin. He did that alone. But if God's plan is that there is a suffering that continues on after his and Jesus ascends to his father, then we share in and complete his sufferings that he identifies with us in, that we uniquely go through. And so that's where you have Paul saying things like, I complete the sufferings of Christ. He's not talking about atonement, penal substitutionary atonement. He's talking about the rejection that continues to take place as his sheep are sent into the wolves. There is a suffering that extends beyond Christ's own suffering 
that God designed for us that we get to continue with, that we get to complete. We complete that plan of suffering that is connected with Christ. So he identifies himself with our suffering and we share in his continued suffering. In Matthew 5 and Matthew 16 and Mark 8 and that next section, we have sufferings that go beyond persecution. Have you noticed so far that the suffering that we've been talking about has only been persecution for being a Christian? Right? But there's, don't worry, there's more <laughs> for us. Um, in, in, in Matthew 5, blessed are those who mourn. Matthew 16, Mark 8, Luke 9. If you're gonna come after me, you must lose your life. You have to lose the life that you've made for yourself apart from Christ. No doubt there's gonna be some loss and some sadness in some of that. A sadness you will not regret. Some of us uh, will go through shipwrecks, maybe even three times like Paul. Romans 5, there are tribulations, those things that just press on you and squeeze you. Romans 8, there's distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul was hungry, thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. He toiled, uh, was reviled and slandered. The outer man just decays from momentary light affliction. 2 Corinthians 6, there are hardships, imprisonments, tumults, sleeplessness. 2 Corinthians 7, there are fears within that even the Apostle Paul had, being depressed. 2 Corinthians 11, we're beaten. Um, there, there are natural dangers of rivers. Paul had to cross rivers. There were robbers. There were urban dangers, wilderness dangers. Just the concern for churches that weighed on him. In 2 Corinthians 12, he had a thorn in the flesh, some kind of a malady, a physical malady. In Philippians 2, Epaphroditus was sick to the point of death for the gospel ministry. Paul says in Philippians 4.12, he knew how to get along in humble means. I bet there was some suffering with that. In James 1 and 1 Peter 1, we are distressed by various kinds of trials, all kinds of them. But... But, and here's the big but. Matthew 5, there's blessing and joy in our sufferings. Blessed are those who mourn. Why? What, is it, what does it say? If, if you're going to suffer for Christ's sake, that's really good news about you. <laughs> that's really good news about you. Because you're not of the world then. The world hates Christ. The world hates the ones that are not of its own. And it's just really good news about you when you suffer for Christ. There's blessing in it. There's joy in it. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Cameron will address that, I know, tomorrow. Also, we are to take courage in. This is Matthew 24. This is all of the language that Jesus gives and the apostles give to believers. We are to take courage in our sufferings. We are to entrust ourselves to God in our sufferings. We are to endure suffering, persevere suffering, overcome in our suffering. That's the kind of language that is used. This is what makes us different. What makes us different as we suffer? Well, we're blessed. We have joy. We endure we persevere, we have courage in the face of suffering. Matthew 5, Romans 5, 2 Corinthians 1. Here are some underappreciated effects from our suffering. There are some really amazing things that we get that just come from our suffering. In Matthew 5, we prove our sonship under the Father when we love our enemies and love your enemies and so prove that you are sons of your Father who's in heaven. So when you love the people that are making you suffer, um, you're proving sonship. You're proving that you're not of the world. This is a blessing. Second Corinthians 1, we are able to comfort others with the comfort that we have received. Uh, Second Corinthians 4, we get an eternal weight of glory that is produced in us from momentary light afflictions. Second Corinthians 12, uh, Paul was kept from exalting himself um, by being given that thorn in the flesh. So one of the things that God will do sometimes is he'll afflict you so you don't become arrogant or don't become prideful. That's a really good thing. It's an underappreciated effect from suffering. Paul says in Philippians 1, 
that his imprisonment brought about greater progress of the gospel. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine suffering and from your own suffering, the gospel spreads even more and people have more courage to speak because you're suffering? That's an underappreciated effect when we suffer. We get our faith tested and it produces endurance and it completes our faith and it produces praise and glory at the coming of Christ. First Peter 4 says that the one who has suffered in the flesh ceased from sin. It's a, there's mortification of sin going on in your life, a sanctification process that God achieves when you suffer. And 1 Peter 5, not, let's look at 1 Peter 5. I, I want you to see this. And I promise we're, we are getting close here. 1 Peter 5, 9. How precious is this? 9 and 10. But resist him, the, the, the devil, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You're not alone. After you have suffered for a little while, that's so precious. After you have suffered for a little while. And, and God could only write that to a believer because an unbeliever is not gonna just suffer for a little while apart from Christ. But you, believer, you're gonna suffer for a little while and after you have the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself, the God of all grace will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. There is a... Um, a drawing near that God does in your suffering where he comes himself to strengthen you. That's an underappreciated effect. And the reward for us in our suffering, amazing. Um, to live now is Christ. To die then is gain. Paul says to depart and be with Christ is very much better. We finally get Christ in ways that we can't have him now. We're considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which we are suffering. Wow, you mean I'm showing that I, I, have, I have a worth for that? Not because I've earned it, not because I've merited it, but because Christ suffered in my place and I have everything from him and all the benefits. Revelation 6 those who suffered according to and were persecuted to death were given a white robe and they were told to rest in the presence of God. In Revelation chapter seven, they are before the throne and they serve him night and day and he spreads his tabernacle over them and they're not hungry anymore and they're not thirsty anymore and they're not scorched by the sun anymore and they have their shepherd and he leads them to springs of water of eternal life and he wipes away every tear from their eye. In Revelation 14, the writer says, blessed are those who die in Christ from here on out. They will have rest from their labors. A day is coming when you'll rest in ways that you just can't rest now. Revelation 20, the ones who have died in Christ, suffered for him, will come alive and reign with him in his kingdom. And the second death has no power over them and they are priests of God with him some pretty amazing rewards for us. And let's look at the one last one here, Revelation 21. Turn there with me. I want you to see this one. Revelation 21, verse three. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. He wanted to say it twice. God will be among them, and God himself will be among them. And look at this, verse four. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. The first things have passed away. The, and what are those first things? It's, it's the sufferings that have been planned by God, not just for himself, but for his people. Those first things have passed away when we are finally with him. 
So if you want to look at your outline, numbers one through eight, you could draw a line up all of those and off to the side you could write first things. And now you need to write number nine because I wasn't smart enough to get all the way to there. <laughs> but you could write number nine and put the end of suffering. Revelation 21.4. Jesus spent all time, tons of his time out in his ministry telling people, if you're gonna follow me, you're gonna suffer. If you're gonna follow me, you're gonna suffer. One simply should not follow Christ until and unless she is aware of his plan for suffering and is willing to embrace it personally. And all of it, the sobering parts of that, but also the blessings that come with suffering in his footsteps, great indescribable blessing and joy and reward that is ours when we overcome in our sufferings. But, but the eyes of a sinner have to be opened. The scales have to fall off and the eyes have to be opened, don't they? To see that the loss of self, the loss of sin, the loss of the world is worth losing and gaining the worth and the beauty of Jesus Christ that would be more desirable even if I had to die for it. Something completely, radically has to be altered in the mind and in the heart. It, you must be born again. Turn back to Revelation 12, verse 11. Here it is. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony and they did not love their life even when faced with death. What has to happen that you would not even love your life if you were faced with death and you'd say, yeah, I'd rather gain Christ. You have to have your eyes opened to see him and what he accomplished in his own suffering and resurrection. I pray that that's the case for each of you. So let me take you back to the goals at the beginning. Your suffering is not an accident, believer. Your suffering is not an uncontrollable rogue element on the loose in the world. Your suffering is not an afterthought in God's mind. And your suffering is not unique to you and unfamiliar to God like he has no idea what you're going through, <laughs> right? He does. Your suffering is not first and worst. Your suffering is second and a privilege. Your suffering can be entrusted to a faithful creator and your suffering should be no surprise. And your suffering can be endured with joy, but you'll have to come back tomorrow to hear Cameron's messages on that. So let's pray. Father, these are um, undeniably clear words from your Bible from front to back about suffering. And it is so, the, the human condition that we are in where sin still lingers just chafes at that message. It does not like it. And I pray that you would help us um, to have clarity where we are at in our, each one of us in our own hearts and minds, our souls with you in this moment whether or not we have truly been saved from our sin by you. And therefore, now we have to have courage to uh, persevere in our suffering. And we pray for joy and we pray for blessing in it from you. Or we have to conclude that we have not yet come to Christ and we want to avoid suffering because of his name. Oh Lord, I pray that you would draw anyone here tonight to your son who has not yet trusted in him and his suffering at the cross for forgiveness of sin. What great hope there is for the one who does. What great change of life is brought to the one who does. What a future there is for the one who does, even if they are martyred for Christ what we have to look forward to with you one day is so glorious. Can we suffer a little longer? We can. Help us to do it and to do it well. In Jesus' name, amen.